So we're going to take a little look at pulmonary emboli and pulmonary hypertension. One of the things with that pulmonary hypertension, especially primary pulmonary hypertension, is basically if you have that, you're living with like a little time bomb within your lungs. At any given time, your um, blood vessels can go into a massive bronchial constriction or vasoconstriction, and if they do, um, it can be the end of you, unfortunately. And there you can see a little pulmonary emboli at this particular point. So remember, there's a difference between a thrombus and an emboli. A thrombus is a clot that's formed and it's remaining in place. An emboli is a clot that's mo moving at that particular point. Um, emboli can end up in the brains, they can end up in the lungs, they can end up in the heart. Just depending on where they lodge and how big they are in some cases will determine you know, what kind of damage is going to be done with it. If it the emboli significantly disrupts pulmonary arterial blood flow, you can end up with a pulmonary infarction. And a saddle embolus is something that we don't see that often, but we do see it. It's kind of interesting. Um, many years ago, one of the students had a case study on a person who had a saddle block emboli. And what they basically told them was the reason that they had that emboli was because they were flat footed. Um, haven't seen any research on it, but that's what they were told. So when you block it, what do we end up with? Uh, we can end up with pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonale. Remember, core pulmonale is right heart failure. We see that with patients who have COPD and different things along that line. Um, there's your pulmonary infarct. Also, atelectasis and consolidation and bronchospasm. Whenever you're sitting there and you cannot get oxygen across that AC membrane, in order to do the best it can, what happens is the vessels in the lungs are going to start to constrict and spasm so that the blood can be shunted or to somewhere else in the hopes of being able to uh, provide it, get it oxygenated and provide it to the rest of the body. So we see DVTs. Remember, we talked a little bit about DVTs yesterday. Uh, we see that with for folks who sometimes are not um, moving a lot. Um, we can see that sometimes with our patients who are in bed um, and not getting up and moving. Uh, what we can do is they can use the TED hose, they can use the compression hose to, to go ahead and do that to keep that blood moving so that they don't end up with those DVTs. Okay. And what you see is there's insidious. And the question in, or the term insidious basically means to me it's sort of sneaking up on you. You're not aware it's happening, but once it hits, you know it's there. Okay. And unfortunately, as you can see, emboli can go undiagnosed. Um, they can go ahead and they can originate in places we're not quite sure where they originate, and they can end up in your lungs or your heart or your brain at that particular point. And there you see for child's triad includes venous stasis. That's where the blood is slowing down. Hypercoagulability. This is where your blood is going to form clots at that point. Remember some of the things that can cause uh, clot formation are too many red blood cells at that particular point. You get too many cells competing at that point. And then also remember you can have disseminated intravascular coagulation where the blood just starts to clot using all the clotting factors and then injury to the endothelium cells that line your vessels. So how do we know that you have one? Well, we have to go ahead and understand what are some of the things that we would see with a patient who has these. Um, you can sometimes do blood tests with them. Sometimes they'll do venous ultrasound sounds with them. At one time out in California, it was a therapist that were doing some of these ultrasounds. Um, and it was pretty exciting when you thought about it. And then they can also do some lung in imaging techniques to see if they can see anything. So some of the tests, like I said, there's a blood test, the D-dimer. D-dimer is coming more into its own. Um, when you looked at the literature, maybe three to four or five years ago, um, there was a 
group big divide between the emergency department docs who used it and the ones that didn't, but it seems to be coming into its own at this particular point. Um, you can also see a ventilation perfusion scan, which are really uh, neat to watch. Sometimes we'll have patients on our ventilators and we'll take them down to radiology and they'll do a VQ scan just to see what's going on. Um, pulmonary angiograms are another one, MRI, MRA, some other things that you can look at. So what do we see with this? Atelectasis, atelectasis, okay? And then also the bronchospasm bronchial constriction we talked about. So what's gonna happen? I know it's a surprise, you've never seen this before. Increased heart rate. Remember with increased heart rate when you're um, hypoxic and these people will be hypoxic, hypoxemic, uh, we're going to see tachycardia. The second one is going to be your tachypnea, the respiratory rate, to provide the gas so that you can get that gas crossing the alveolar capillary membrane. You are going to uh, stimulate your chemoreceptors and see what else you can get going on there too. You also have systemic hypotension, decreased blood pressure, cyanosis, and you can have some coughing and hemoptysis to go with it. We can also see um, distended neck veins. You'll see a positive JVD. Uh, swollen and tender liver, when the blood is backing up and it bags, backs up into hepatic veins, it's going to cause the liver to swell because now you're storing something in the liver that's not normally stored that in that amount. Um, chest pain, decreased chest expansion, other things that go with it, your syncope, remember that you're fainting, your lightheadedness. People are confused, especially if there's an emboli going around on their brain and causing them some issues. And the heart sounds are a little bit different. We're going to talk about the heart sounds later. Uh, S1, S2 are quite normal. However, what's supposed to happen, they're supposed to occur, um, for example, the S1, P1, um, S2, P2 are supposed to occur just about the same time. There's reasons to cause them to split, um, and this is one that will cause to see some splitting that you see going on. So crackles and wheezes and a pleural friction rub. If you want to hear pleural friction rub, if you don't have hand lotion on your hands, you can rub your hand against your the bottom part where your thumb is, and it sounds almost like Velcro. And it's interesting when you're listening to it because that's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, arterial blood gases. Um, I think you guys have seen this once or twice. And then what happens with the severe stage with them? And then your EKGs, you guys have talked about EKGs with Therese. Now we're going to see some SVT, okay, PSVT, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. And in some folks, people actually put the sinus tach, the atrial rhythms, and everything underneath that at that particular point. And some actually break it out, and that's what this PowerPoint has done. Um, and you can see also a bright bundle branch and then some P2P waves that you don't normally see. And so what do we see? Increased density in, far, in infarcted areas because the, there's necrosis sometimes going on. And then um, hyperradiolucency distal to the embolus because you don't have anything going on back there. It's just sort of sitting there waiting for the world to show up at that point. Dilation of the pulmonary arteries are really interesting to see on an x-ray, if you have a chance to go into one of the radiology sites, you can actually see it. Uh, you can see the pulmonary edema, the cardiomegaly, all that good stuff. And if you're going to have anything, most of the time it's going to be a small pleural effusion. And as you can see, an emboli is a life-threatening condition. It can kill you in a heartbeat. It can cause a major stroke in the same amount of time. And so this is something that we always have to watch. And there's different things that we do with this, okay? Your patient's going to end up at the ICU. They're going to be given some anticoagulant heparin at that particular point. Um, sometimes they'll put in what they call a filter in the vessels in the inferior vena cava. Um, if you've watched any TV in the last couple of years, you'll notice that uh, there's a lot of lawyers on town, um, not only in town here, but through the country that will tell you if you had a filter put in and it moved and caused you problems, you know, contact us and we'll sue the company and get you some money. We're going to take the majority of it, but at least you'll get a couple of bucks from it. Um, but there's different types of heparin that we can give you. 
and see what's going to happen. And Warfarin is coming in is one that you'll see at that particular point. Your clot busters or your um, streptokinase and all of those things that you have Alteplase. Alteplase is also known as TPA, tissue plasma activator. Alteplase is what we can use with the pulmonary emboli. We also use it when people are having clots in their heart. If you have a MI and it's caused by a clot, if it's um, within the time limit and you're not bleeding or anything else like that, then we can give you the TPA. It's the same as if you're having a stroke, if you're having an ischemic stroke, which is caused by a clot, we can also give you the TPA. Um, normally within about four and a half hours, they've extended the time a little bit at that point. The major key to using these drugs is you cannot be on blood thinners because if we give these to you on top of blood thinners, um, fortunately sometimes you have a problem with bleeding out. So how do we manage pulmonary emboli? Walking, exercise, fluids. Don't let your blood get thicker. We don't think about dehydrating and the blood becoming thicker, but you have to remember plasma is 90% water. And in that plasma is the red blood cells and your electrolytes and everything else that's being carried around. And if you start to dehydrate, the plasma percentage that you have, it's normally 55%, will decrease. And when it decreases, it gives you a relatively high um, hematocrit, which means that your blood, um, red blood cells are going to have a tendency to increase only because you don't have enough liquid in the plasma. So you have to keep your um, fluid up. The other half of that, though, is, is that you don't want to drown your fluid either. Okay. Um, compression stockings, like I said, we can go ahead and do the TED hoses or the compression um, pumps that we use on occasions. There's your filter, and then you can also do an embolectomy. So what do we do? We have the oxygen protocol. You need oxygen. Um, some medications on occasions uh, to relax the airways, to try to open them, and then lung expansion therapy is something we're going to do too. Pulmonary hypertension, this is kind of an interesting one. If you look at it and you look closely, you're going to see the right ventricle, and then you'll see that enlarged right ventricle. You can see it really, really is quite large at that particular point. And then you can see with the little pictures on there uh, what's going on with the vessels at that particular point. So basically, if your mean arterial pressure is greater than about 25 millimeters of mercury, Normally, you got a problem, okay, because it's way too high. Normal range is like 10 to 20, 15 is the average that we like to see at that point. Um, and we do see pulmonary hypertension sometimes because of your COPD or whatever other diseases that you have going on. Unfortunately, more common with women than men to a 3 to 1 ratio. And then there's different uh, groups with different treatment options as well. It too can be insidious. You may not even realize what you have or not even realize how bad it is until something happens. And unfortunately, sometimes that which happens is the fact that you're, or you die as a result of it. So you have left-sided heart failure, right-sided heart failure, right-sided, most of it is COPD, coronary artery disease, um, pulmonary embolic disease, a lot of times things that are happening before you get the right side of the heart and then just the right side of the heart itself. Left-sided heart, congestive heart failure, and it normally is what also causes your pulmonary hypertension. It has no cure, and that's why I said it's one of those ticking time bombs that unfortunately uh, when it goes off, there's sometimes you're never not going to make it. So what do we do? We have to give you diuretics to decrease fluid buildup, blood thinning medications to help prevent blood clots, and then digoxin is a drug that's been around for a long time. Um, some people will tell you, uh, man, it's going to take shorten your life. Um, however, in some cases, it's going to make your life longer. So um, it's worth the effort or worth the uh, risk to take it. It's a fairly safe drug.
oxygen therapy because of hypoxemia. Remember that um, Medicare will, in fact, give you oxygen, prescribe oxygen for you um, if you have PPH, primary pulmonary hypertension, uh, physical activity, and sometimes inhaled nitric oxide. The problem, remember, with inhaled nitric oxide is that once it leaves the vascular system and gets into the regular of the vascular system, system outside the lung, then we have the problem with methemoglobin, okay? And so then there's some drugs that go with this also that we have to watch. Um, one of the drugs that I know you guys have heard about, which is Viagra. Um, Viagra actually was um, developed to take care of PPH, and then it made its way into the regular market. 